Hello. Um, my name is Jutta Fritz and I run the Jewish Community Center of Budapest and I also work as a Jewish educational uh, professional at the Sarvash camp. And I thought actually uh, after a lot of thinking that I'm gonna t um, I'm gonna talk about the Jews of Kaifeng. So what prompts someone um, to choose a subject that is so far-fetched uh, from all of us um, in Central Europe? Um, and I tell you why, because uh, this is an, a thrilling and very exciting topic that I came across very accidentally. And, uh, and then I thought this is something that the whole world should know as a community professional, somebody who's Who's, who's working in community building and whose main task is basically to create a safe space and a space where the Jewish community members can come and thrive. Um, one of the many questions you ask yourself is what, what is Jewish community and, and what, um, what enables its survival and, um, and and uh, and is it enough if it survives, or is there something else? So, so these are the kind of questions that led me to to decide to talk about the Jews of Kaifeng. So, the Jews of Kaifeng, which is of course in uh, China, arrived uh, to Kaifeng, which was the capital of the uh, of the Song Dynasty, around the 10th century. Basically, by the 19th century, the community ceased to exist after. And uh, after a thousand year history of being a Jewish community in Kaifeng, it ceased to exist. So what are the reasons? You know, when you, when you hear about Jewish communities cease to exist, of course, for us uh, Europeans, one of, the, one of the obvious answers, like how come a community ceases to exist is the Holocaust, anti-Semitism. Well, it's probably not the answer here. So, so let's see this, uh, this uh, very thrilling history. So 960, around 960, Kaifeng, which is, as I said, the capital of the Song dynasties, is, is, a, is a thriving, bustling uh, capital. It's a metropolis. It's one of the stops on the Silk uh, Way, um, on the Silk Road. And somewhere at this time, a group of Persian Jews, uh, merchants or maybe refugees enter the city. Uh, they get an audience from the emperor and the emperor is very thankful for the cotton that they brought and he tells them you came to our China so respect and observe the tradition of your ancestors and transfer it and transmit it here in our place here in Pian Liang in Kaifeng. So these are the words actually that in 1489, the descendants of, uh, of these Jews uh, engrave on the, on the memorial stone that stands in the courtyard of their synagogue and which was built in 1163 and which is at the crossroads of the, of the earth market and the street of the fire gods. Today, actually, hundreds of Kaifeng inhabitants think of themselves as descendants of uh, Beit Israel. And they, they think this um, despite the fact that their, their faces, their, uh, their characteristics are not different from their neighbors. Uh, they haven't had a rabbi for two centuries or synagogues or any kind of uh, community organizations and they don't remember anything from the faith of their ancestors, the traditions of their ancestors. The street where, um, where many of them live um, is called the street of the sect which teaches scriptures. Well, the Kehila in Kaifeng, which was never more than 1,000 to 2,000 people, um, has received a lot of attention lately um, because through them probably we can get a lot of information about survival and disappearance of Jewish communities. So we don't know how Jews got to China, we're not sure, 
uh, but uh, but many of the Jews in in Babylon actually uh, wandered to the east and and got to China, and we also know that there was a very thriving um, uh, commerce between uh, China and their western neighbors, and probably there were a lot of Jews who participated in this. We have uh, the, the document uh, that proves uh, at least the presence of one Jew uh, from 718. Uh, it's written with Hebrew letters on a, on a uh, paper that was manufactured in China in the language of Judeo-Persian. This Jew, Ispahani, um, is asking for the help of, uh, of someone of the same faith. Uh, to to free him uh, from this flock of sheep, which is very bad quality. Um, and then we hear later on also from people who wrote like a Muslim chronicler uh, who, um, who tells about um, uh, Jews in the, in the 12th century, um, sorry, in the 14th century, and he quotes like, they went into the city through the Jewish gate. And then later on, there are also uh, Christian uh, travelers who also talk about Jews. Um, up until the 16th century, when a missionary is actually telling the Pope about a china Judeo community. Um, and though Kaifeng had millions of inhabitants uh, while it was the capital of the Song dynasty, uh, it became well known um, in the European intellectual circles only in the 17th century. By then it was only a provincial town, um, much less inhabitants, and it was not actually the, the, the city itself that called the attention uh, to itself um, of the European intellectuals, but the, the discovery that there is a Jewish community in it, which has been there for kind of ever. Uh, and all this through a very tragic comical meeting in Beijing in 1605. And this meeting is between Matteo Ricci, who was a Jesuit uh, monk, and, um, and the a Kaifeng Mandarin, Aitian, um, Aitian arrives to Beijing with the desire to become a civil servant and uh, to have a job as a civil servant, kind of like a better job uh, than he already had. And before he left uh, to Beijing, he read a book. Um, and this book was called The Things That I Heard About. Uh, and in this book, um, he reads about this gr small group of Europeans led by Ricci, who were brought to China uh, by their faith um, and who uh, through a lot of petitions they um, they get the the permission to build uh, to build a house of prayer uh, these strangers says the book uh, uh, claim that they belong to a faith which is based on monotheism and which is uh, very similar to to what the, the descendants of the Prophet Muhammad actually brought uh, many centuries later to China. And what surprised the, the reader that, or the, the author that these Europeans uh, persist uh, that they are not Muslims um, and insist that they're not Muslims. So, so the question arises, so what kind of faith is it that is based on monotheism and the Europeans brought to China? Uh, for Aitian, this was simple. If Matteo Ricci uh, and his group is convinced that they are monotheists and they're not Muslims, then what else can they be than Jews? Uh, like him, like this Aitian and his whole, his whole kahila, his whole community. And so this enlightened him and uh, and inspired him and he thought this is like this is the new chapter in the um, in the history of these isolated Kaifeng Jews uh, who have been for generations uh, totally isolated for, from the non-Chinese non uh, Jews. So this journey to Beijing is a new opportunity um, 
and so he wanted to seek out these European Jews and and talk about his community and hear about them and to revive the the the, the connections between the communities. So he arrives to Beijing. He went. He goes to this Jesuit church, which he thought was a synagogue. Synagogue. He's dressed as a Mandarin and he looks as Chinese as somebody possibly can, and. Uh, you know, and he introduces himself to Matteo Ricci, who he thinks is a rabbi, which totally surprises Ricci. Um, in the last two decades, Ricci was searching for um, for Christian communities uh, who he he knew that they existed in China centuries ago, and now he's standing in front of one of them. So after a few minutes of very excited uh, conversation, the priest um, in, in, welcomes uh, Ai Tian into the chapel where there's the, on the altar is, uh, is Mary and, the, this, uh, and baby Jesus and uh, St. John. And Richie bows to them um, and Ai Tian looks at the picture and totally misunderstands it and thinks it's Rebecca, Jacob and Esav. He, of course, bows down, um, thinking, okay, our ancestor did not really bow down in front of pictures, but he wants to uh, respect his ancestors. Um, so there's a whole misunderstanding. Of course, they clarify later on and, uh, and Richie, uh, is left by Aitian with the disappointment that he did not uh, meet uh, Jews and Richie is disappointed because he did not meet Chinese Christians. Um, so Aitian learns about uh, Christianity and uh, but he actually thinks, you know what, he's not less Jewish than what he learned in Kaifeng and he actually asks Mata Orici um, to to become uh, their rabbi and to come to Kaifeng. Uh, the only thing he requires Richie to do is not to eat pork. So you can see that this is uh, a totally bizarre story. Everything we know about the Kaifeng Jews is from three sources, either historical or uh, liturgical or folk uh, collections uh, based on the word of mouth and from Jesuit missionaries. Thank you.